Preface and Introduction of a Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson. Preface the following lectures were delivered in the farmer's lecture course at the college of agriculture minneapolis during the session of eighteen eighty four the topics selected at previous sessions had been such as to especially interest the male members of the large classes in attendance and it was considered no more than fair to the women of the state that attention should be given to such matters as would aid them in the conduct of home duties influenced by this desire I secured the services of Miss Juliet Corson, the superintendent of the New York School of Cookery, and so widely known wherever the English language is spoken, by her publications and writings upon all topics relating to domestic economy. The interest manifested in this course of lectures by the ladies of Minnesota was shown by the crowded audiences present at each exercise, nearly twelve hundred of whom registered their name and addresses, a list of which is appended to this report. The lectures were familiar extemporaneous discourses upon the topics under discussion, and the lecturer was surrounded by all the appointments of a well-ordered kitchen. The dishes as prepared were passed to the audience for examination and criticism, and full opportunity allowed for discussion. This statement is necessary to explain the colloquial character of the discourses in placing these lectures before the public the editor does but simple justice to miss corson in stating that circumstances have prevented the preparation by her of a finished report and have compelled the publication of the notes taken at the cooking lessons but if the form of the instruction is devoid of rhetorical style the editor guarantees its accuracy although miss corson is a steady worker her usefulness is curtailed by serious illness in this instance therefore indulgence is claimed for the method whatever graces of literature the reader seeks may be found in the author's other published works here the public is entreated to accept a very plain record of the work done at the state university by miss corson a word of explanation is due to the members of the class who were promised copies of these lectures i had full reports taken at the time by a stenographer they were written out shortly after and sent to Miss Corson, as by her request, for review. But owing to her protracted and nearly fatal illness and very slow recovery, these notes have only recently been returned to me. I hope this statement will relieve me from any charges of neglect which the ladies might otherwise be disposed to make. Edward D. Porter, Professor in Charge Introduction This course of lectures is designed to meet the wants of two classes of persons, first those who are experienced housekeepers familiar with the principles and practice of cookery but who desire information concerning the preparation of the finer dishes of the modern school second the young ladies in attendance at the university and others like them who have had their time and attention so engrossed with studies and other duties that they have not had the opportunity to qualify themselves in this most important branch of a woman's education to meet the wants of the first class the morning exercises will be devoted to the preparation of palatable and nutritious dishes suitable for everyday use in families of moderate means and some of the finer dishes will be introduced as the afternoons are the only times at which the young ladies of the university can be present these sessions will be devoted to practical illustrations of the elementary principles of household management and cookery as time permits some of the salient points in the chemistry of food and the physiology of nutrition will be briefly discussed end of preface and introduction lecture one of a course of lectures on the principle of domestic economy and cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson Lecture 1 Our lesson this morning, ladies, will consist of the preparation of what is called soup stock, 
or beef broth, which is the basis of many kinds of soup. It is very easily made, simple in its composition, and exceedingly nutritious. The other dishes to be made are boiled salmon with cream sauce, potatoes stewed in butter, and quail, boned and broiled. I give you the boned quail to show you what an exceedingly simple operation boning is. It is supposed to be very difficult, and it is done sometimes in curious ways, but the best way is the simplest and easiest. If we have time, we will prepare a few omelettes. As I shall begin with soup stock, you will take your receipt for that. For each quart of soup stock or broth which you intend to make, use one pound of meat and bone. By that I mean meat and bone weighed together. The cut which I have here is from the upper part of the leg, next to the round. You can use any cut of the leg, the shank, which is the lower part of the leg, or the neck. Any of the cheaper parts of meat will answer for soup meat. First, cut the meat from the bone. The butcher will always do that for you. Then have the bone broken into small pieces. The butcher, of course, will do that very much more easily than you can do it. Do not wash the meat. Wipe it all over with a towel wet in cold water. Put the bones in the bottom of the soup kettle, laying the meat on the bones. Then add cold water, in the proportion of a quart to each pound of meat and bones. Set the soup kettle over the fire and let the broth slowly heat and boil. As it boils, a scum will rise to the surface, which is to be removed in case you are preparing stock for clear soup. The scum is composed of the blood and the albumen of the meat, and is only removed for the purpose of clarifying the soup. It is nutritious, and for that reason it should always be saved. In France, and in kitchens where French cooks are employed, this scum is used either in thick soup, for instance in vegetable soup, such as I shall make this afternoon, or put into brown sauces or gravies. Remember, it is nothing that is to be thrown away. It is to be saved because it is both nutritious and savoury. It adds flavour and nutriment to any dish to which it is added. While the soup meat is being boiled for the first time, prepare the vegetables. For three or four pounds of meat, which will make as many quarts of soup, use one medium-sized carrot, which is to be scraped, a turnip, which is to be peeled, and an onion, which is also to be peeled, in such a way as to prevent breaking apart. Take off the outer dry skin of the onion without trimming it closely. Do not cut it off at the top, because in that way you will cause the layers to break apart. After the onion is peeled, stick a dozen whole cloves into it. The cloves are added to the soup for the purpose of flavouring it. You very often hear the remark made that the cookery of certain people has an indefinable taste, exceedingly nice but something that you do not exactly understand. It is always produced by a combination of seasonings and flavourings. In this soup I shall use for seasoning not only the cloves in the onions, but a dozen peppercorns, that is, unground grains of pepper, instead of ground pepper, because I want the soup to be perfectly clear. I shall use also bay leaves, which may be new to some of you, they are the dried leaves of the laurel or bay tree, and can be bought at any drug store. You can buy five cents worth of them, and they will last you a year or more. The seasoning is slightly aromatic. For four quarts of soup, use only a little leaf, or a piece of a large leaf. Use also a blade of mace, and a sprig of any dried herb, except sage. The peppercorns, the bay leaf, the blade of mace, and the sprig of sweet herb are tied in the midst of a little bunch of parsley, the stalk with all the leaves on, and if it is ever marketed here, with the root on, use that as well. The root of the parsley has all the flavour of the leaf intensified, and you have only to thoroughly wash it 
and then use it. All these dried herbs are to be gathered inside of the parsley and tied in a little bunch. Tie the parsley by winding string around it, enclosing all the dried herbs. This little bunch is called in cooking books a faggot or bouquet of herbs. It is what gives soups and sauces that indefinable, spicy, delicate flavour so much liked. After the soup stock boils, remove whatever scum has risen, put in the faggot, the turnip, the carrot, the onion stuck with cloves, and for the four quarts of soup, a heaping tablespoon of salt. Keep the soup stock covered as much as possible while it is heating, and after you have put in the vegetables, keep it covered all the time. Let it boil very slowly. After all the vegetables are in, set the kettle back, so that the heat of the fire strikes from one side. Let it boil from one side, and gently. In that way, you begin the clarifying. You will find, if you boil the stock from one side, and very gently, then when you strain it after it is done, it already will be as clear as most clear soup. After it has been strained, tomorrow, we shall clarify it in order to show the process, which is very simple. Then it will be what is called on hotel bills of fare, clear soup. After the vegetables have been added, let the stock boil for at least two hours. In that length of time, the flavour of the vegetables and the nourishment from the meat will be extracted, but not the gelatin from the bones. It is the gelatin in the bones which makes broth or stock jelly when it is cold. In order to extract the gelatine, it is necessary to boil the soup meat and bones at least five hours. The soup can be strained at the end of two hours, or boiled five or six hours, keeping it covered so that none of it wastes or evaporates. When the soup is boiled, strain it. Use an earthen bowl or jar, set a colander in it, and lay a towel folded twice in the colander, having the colander either over the bowl or jar. Pour the soup into the towel, and let it run through without squeezing because if you squeeze the towel, you will force small particles of scum through, and thus cloud the soup. After the soup has run through the towel, let it cool. Do not cover it whilst it is cooling, unless you are afraid of flies or insects getting into it. In that case, cover it with a sieve. If you cover it with a solid earthen cover or plate, the steam arising from the soup will condense on the under part of the cover and fall back into the soup. If the weather is warm, or if it is a close rainy day, the steam condensed, falling back into the warm soup, will cause it to sour. For this reason, when you put away a dish of meat or vegetables after dinner, do not cover them until they are cold. Boiled Salmon with Cream Sauce In boiling a whole fish, or a large piece, use cold water. If you put a large piece of fish into boiling water, the outside will be cooked before it is done near the bone. Nothing is more disagreeable than a piece of fish half raw at the bone. It is uneatable. For a small piece of fish, such as I have here, use boiling salted water enough to cover it, and boil it until the flakes begin to separate, or until by testing a fin, you can easily pull it out. That will probably be, if you use cold water, soon after the water boils. If you put the fish into boiling water, it may be five or more minutes. Boil the fish, whether it is large or small, until you can pull out a fin or until the flakes separate. Then drain it and serve it with any nice sauce. Today, I will make a very simple one, cream sauce. Of course, you would always make the sauce while you were boiling the fish, taking care to have both done at the same time. For a pint of sauce, use a heaping tablespoonful of butter and a tablespoonful of flour. Put them in a saucepan over the fire, 
and stir them together until they are smoothly mixed. Then begin to add hot milk, half a cupful at a time. When the first half cupful of milk is stirred in, put in another half cupful, and again stir until it is smooth. Continue to add milk until you have used a pint, or until the sauce is about the consistency of thick cream. There will always be a margin there for a little discretion, because some flour will thicken very much more than others. Flour that is very rich in gluten will thicken more than that which has most starch in it. But you have there about the right proportions. A tablespoonful of flour, a tablespoonful of butter, a pint of milk. Add more or less milk as required to make the sauce the consistency of thick cream, or of a thickness which will coat the spoon. That is, if you dip a spoon in and hold it up, the sauce will not all run off like water. When all the milk has been used, season the sauce with a level teaspoonful of salt and about a quarter of a salt spoon of white pepper. I speak of white pepper particularly because in making a white sauce, if you use the ordinary black pepper, the sauce will be full of little black specks. The white pepper is quite as cheap, quite as plentiful as the black pepper. All the grocers keep it, and its flavour is nicer, rather more delicate, scarcely as pungent as the black pepper. There is a certain biting, acrid flavour in the black pepper, which does not exist in the white pepper. The latter contains all the stimulating property and all the aromatic flavour. After the same is finished, keep it hot by setting the saucepan containing it in a pan of hot water on the back of the stove. A perfectly plain white sauce, which can be made the basis of an infinite variety of other sauces, is made by substituting water for milk. By leaving out the pepper and salt, and using sugar for sweetening, you can make a nice pudding sauce. If you add a tablespoonful of chopped parsley to a pint of white sauce, you make parsley sauce. Putting a few capers into it makes caper sauce. A teaspoonful of anchovies dissolved in it makes anchovy sauce. It is easily made the basis of a great many sauces, the name of which depends on preferred addition to the white sauce. Egg sauce is made by adding chopped hard-boiled eggs to white sauce. Question by a lady. Would you ever substitute cornstarch for flour? Miss Corson. You can if you wish. You must use your own discretion about the quantities. Simply get the thickness of thick cream. Question. Is it better to use a porcelain vessel, or will tin do? Miss Corson. Use any saucepan made of material thick enough to prevent burning. Question. Do you put the fish right into the water, or have you a fish kettle? Miss Corson. If you are using a fish kettle, you will have a little wire frame. You can lay the fish on that or you can tie it up in a cloth, if you wish to. Question. Then how can you tell when it is done? Miss Corson. If you tie it in a cloth, you must leave a little space so that you can test it. Question. How much pepper did you say to put in the sauce? Miss Corson. About a quarter of a salt spoon, that is, a good pinch of pepper. One of the ladies asked me about using a thick saucepan, porcelain-lined saucepan. You will find the advantage of thick saucepans of all kinds is that they are less likely to burn than thin ones. The thinner the metal the saucepan is made of, the more likely it is to burn. There are so many different kinds of utensils that every lady can take her own choice. Black saucepans lined with tin or with porcelain tin saucepans, thin ones, and thick ones made of block tin. You notice that I use copper saucepans. Coppers are the most durable. They are lined with tin, and they have to be relined about once a year. The cost of relining is very little, comparatively little. 
I think it costs me about three cents a foot to have them relined, and the copper never wears out. If you buy a copper saucepan, you have got something that lasts you all your life, and you can leave it as an heirloom. If you don't want to do that, you can sell it for old copper, for nearly as much as you paid for it. In using copper, you must never let them become bare on the inside. If the tin wears off, and the copper is exposed to any acid in the food cooked, it is apt to form a poisonous combination. But with proper care and cleanliness, copper saucepans are perfectly safe. Question. Do you prefer them to the galvanised iron? Miss Corson. Yes, I do, on the score of cleanliness, economy and ease in cooking. Question. Do you use a wooden spoon from choice? Miss Corson. Yes. Of course you can understand, ladies, that I could very soon scrape the tin off of the inside of a saucepan with a metal spoon, a knife, or anything of that sort. Copper saucepans should be cleaned with a rag, a little sapolio, and hot water. If they are cleaned as fast as they are used, they are no more trouble to keep clean than any other saucepan. I use in stirring simply a small pudding stick, an old-fashioned wooden pudding stick. It does not scrape the saucepans, and there is no danger of uncooked flour accumulating on the sticks, as it does in the bowl of a spoon. If you are stirring with a spoon, some of the half-cooked flour might get into the bowl of the spoon, and then your sauce would have the taste of the raw flour. I will leave the stick in the saucepan and pass it about so that you can see what I mean. Anyone can whittle these little sticks out using any kind of hardwood. Do not use softwood. You will have noticed, ladies, if you have ever put sauce of this kind, thick sauce, to keep hot, it may have grown very much thicker by standing. In such case, add a little more milk or water, and a little more seasoning when you are ready to use it. Question. How do you make perfectly clear sauce? Miss Corson. You can make a nearly clear thick sauce by using arrowroot. Of course, a clear thin sauce is simply sugar dissolved in water, with butter or flavouring as you like. Potatoes, stewed in butter. The potatoes are peeled and sliced in rather small slices of even size. Put them over the fire in enough salted boiling water to cover them. Boil them until they begin to grow tender, not till they break, but just till they begin to grow tender. After the potatoes are boiled tender, drain them. And suppose you have a pint bowl full of potatoes, Use about two heaping tablespoonfuls of butter. Melt the butter in a scant half cup full of milk. When the butter is melted, put the potatoes into it, and with a spoon, lift them very carefully from the bottom, always without breaking them, until they have absorbed the milk and butter. Then season them with salt and white pepper, and they will be ready to serve. Season them palatably. I could not give you the quantity of seasoning, because it would depend upon the salt that the potatoes had absorbed from the water. You should taste them first before seasoning at all, and then if they need any more salt, add a very little at a time. If you simply want the potatoes nicely stewed, you don't add so much butter, a scant tablespoonful, and milk enough to moisten them. But this receipt is an exceedingly nice one, rather rich, but very nice. At this point, the fish was done, and Miss Corson continued. You notice, ladies, that I take off the skin of the fish before taking it up. That is very easy. It slips off easily, and without it the fish is much nicer to serve at the table. In serving sauce with fish, you pour some around it, not over it. Or you serve the fish on a napkin and the sauce in a dish, as you prefer. If you serve the fish in a folded napkin, garnish it with a few sprigs of parsley if you can get them, or with a lemon sliced if you do not live, as some unfortunate people do, fifty miles from a lemon. Lemons are very nice always with any kind of fish. 
Parsley can be bought here all winter long. I have learned that from the advertisements in the papers already, and a little of it makes a great difference in the appearance of a dish. Question. Can you tell us how we can tell whether a frozen fish is stale or fresh? Miss Corson. You can after you have thawed it in cold water. You can tell by the smell. Laughter. The way to thaw frozen fish is to put it into perfectly cold water and keep it in a cold place until all the frost is drawn out. Of course, the most of the fish in this market would be frozen in the winter. This one has been frozen. Question. Can you tell us how to carve a whole fish? Miss Corson. You would have a rather sharp knife and spoon. A fish knife, though it looks pretty, is not good to serve fish with, because it is apt to be dull. You want a knife that will cut down through the fish without tearing it, without attempting to cut down through the bone, unless you know where the joints are located. Question. Would you cook a fish with the fins? Miss Corson. The latest fancy of fish lovers in New York, the members of the Ichthyophagus Club, who are supposed to be the leaders in the fashions of fish, is to have the fish served with the fins, head and tail on, and with some fish they want even the scales, and then they simply lift off the skin, the entire skin, before they begin to serve it. They have the fish thoroughly washed and drawn, and then cooked with the scales and fins on. You can judge how easy it would be to do that, because you saw how easily that skin came off this fish. The skin comes off easily if the fish is properly cooked, cooked enough. Question. What kind of fish can be cooked with the scales on? Miss Corson. I think the black bass and some kinds of sea fish. The idea is that if the fish are not scaled, they will keep their flavour. A fish properly dressed retains enough of its flavour, even if it is scalded before it is cooked. Omelettes First, I will make a plain breakfast omelette. Use for two or three people, not more than three eggs. You cannot very well manage more than three in an ordinary pan. It is better to make several omelettes, especially because people are not apt to come to the table all at once and an omelette to be nice must be eaten directly it is cooked. Say three eggs. Break them into a cup or bowl. Add to them a salt spoonful of salt, quarter of a salt spoonful of pepper, and mix them just enough to thoroughly break the whites and yolks together. Put over the fire a frying pan with a heaping teaspoonful of butter in it. Let the butter get hot. If you like an omelette brown, let the butter begin to brown. After pouring the eggs into the hot frying pan, break the omelette on the bottom of the pan with a fork, just a little, so that you let the uncooked part run down on the bottom of the pan. I do not mean to stir the omelette as you would scrambled eggs, but just break it a little until it is cooked as much as you want it. French breakfast omelettes are always cooked so that they are slightly juicy in the middle. In order to accomplish that result, of course, you have them still liquid before you begin to turn them. When the omelette is done as much as you want it, run a fork under one side of it and fold it half over, then fold it again, loosen it from the pan, have a platter hot and turn the omelette out. Serve it the moment it is done. Next, I will make a light omelette. The same rule, three eggs. Whites and yolks separate. Beat the whites to a stiff froth. Add seasoning to the yolks in the same proportion as before. Mix the yolks slightly with the seasoning. After the white has been beaten quite stiff and the yolk seasoned, mix them very lightly together. Have a heaping tablespoon of butter in the frying pan over the fire, hot, just as for the plain omelette. Mix the whites and the yolks together without breaking down the white. Of course, the lightness of the omelette depends on keeping all the air in the white of the egg that you have beaten into it. Put the eggs into the hot frying pan, run the fork under the omelette, and lift it from the pan as it cooks. 
lift the cooked portions from the pan and let them fall back on the top of the omelette, taking care not to pat the omelette down at all, but just lift the cooked portions and let them fall back on the top of the omelette until it is done as much as you like. Usually this omelette is served soft, as soft as ice cream. When it is done as much as you want it, push it to the side of the pan gently and then turn it out onto a hot platter. Always remember that the success of an omelette depends upon the quickness with which it is made and served, because, in the first place, you make it light by beating air into it, then, of course, the heat expands the air, and that makes the omelette still lighter, and you must get it served before the hot air escapes. Boning Quail After the quail have been picked, cut the wings off at the first joint. Cut the legs just above the joint of the drumstick. Cut off the head, take out the crop. Cut the quail down the backbone. From the inside, cut the joint where the wing joins the body, and having cut that wing joint, begin and cut close to the carcass of the bird till you get down to the leg joint, where the second joint of the leg unites with the body. Break that joint, and keep on cutting the flesh from the carcass, taking care not to cut through the carcass so that you strike the intestines, until you reach the ridge of the breastbone. Close to the breastbone you will find that little division in the flesh of the breast which you have noticed in carving chickens and turkeys. It is called the little fillet and lies close to the breastbone. Separate this natural division from the outside of the breast. Then beginning again on the other side, cut close to the carcass of the bird until you have reached the breast as on the other side. Now the flesh is loose on both sides of the bird and needs only to be taken off without breaking the skin of the breast. You would bone chickens and turkeys in the same way. Take the carcass out entire. Now take out the wing and leg bones from the inside. Do not tear the skin of the bird any more than you can help. Now lay the flesh on the table, with the skin down, and straighten it out a little, distributing the flesh evenly over the skin, and it is ready to stuff. If I were making boned turkey, I should have it all ready, just like this, and then put the force meat in, draw the bird up over the force meat, and sew it down the back. This bird is simply going to be broiled. Season with salt and pepper. In preparing boned birds, you can use any kind of force meat, a layer of sausage meat, or any kind of chopped cold meat. Season it with salt and pepper. Put the birds between the bars of the wire gridiron and broil them with a very hot fire. The gridiron should be well buttered so that the birds cannot stick. By the time the bird is broiled brown on both sides, it will be done. Of course, you do half a dozen or a dozen in the same way precisely. Remember, ladies, always, that to broil you should use the hottest fire you can get, the hottest and the clearest fire because part of the success of broiling depends upon quickly cooking the outside, while the inside of anything you are broiling still remains juicy. If you had a wood fire, you would broil over the fire. If you broil over the fire, you must expect the blaze to rise, and you must naturally suppose the meat will be smoked. But you can make your fire clear, that is, have it alive, do not have it smoky and full of unburnt wood or coal. Have a clear bed of coals if you are going to broil over the fire. Question. Do you never wash the birds before boiling? Answer. No. You will find that I am very unneat about that. In the first place, I would not use a piece of meat or a bird of any kind that was really dirty enough to need washing. If it had anything on it that I could not get off by wiping with a wet cloth, I simply wouldn't use it. If you wash meat or poultry, you destroy a certain amount of its flavouring and take away some of its nourishment. Question. Sometimes a bird shot will have a great deal of the blood settle in the breast or in the flesh. Miss Corson. 
Yes, you want the blood, you want to keep the blood there. The blood is a part of the nourishment. The idea of washing meat comes from the old Hebrew prohibition, which involved the removal of every particle of blood. You know that the Hebrews believed that the blood was the life, and even to this day every particle of blood is taken away from their meat, not only by washing after it comes into the house, but before that by the treatment it receives from the butcher. The blood is part of the nourishment, and you want to keep as much of it as you can. In some cooking it forms a very important part. For instance, in cooking a hare or rabbit, the blood which escapes in the dressing is saved and used. Question. Would you treat prairie chicken, grouse or partridge in this way? Miss Corson. Yes, in the same way. Question. Not if you were going to roast turkey? Miss Corson. One of my good friends in the far northwest several years ago sent me a nice recipe for making a fricassee of chicken, which I will tell you. The recipe says that after the chicken was picked, you might wash it thoroughly with nice soap then rinse it. Laughter. Now, if you like, you can prepare it that way. No, you will find, ladies, that if you use a cloth well wet in cold water, you can remove all objectionable matter from the outside of meat or poultry. Indeed, if a piece of meat or poultry cannot be cleansed with a wet cloth, it is not clean enough to use. One lady asks me about keeping meat for a long time. Of course, that is a question of taste entirely, whether you like meat hung a long time or whether you like it fresh. All meat, when it is first killed, whether it is poultry or game or the ordinary domestic meat, is very tender. It is tender until the flesh begins to grow cold, until the animal heat, etc., parts from the flesh. Then it becomes tough, rigid and hard and remain so until the process of decomposition begins. I do not mean until it begins to taint, but until it begins to decompose. At that point, it begins to grow tender. It is still fresh and good enough for food. Remember that the hanging of meat is for the purpose of allowing it to begin to decompose. End of Lecture 1 Lecture Second of A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson. Lecture Second Our lesson this afternoon will consist of some plain soups and stews of meat. I shall begin with a soup of yellow split peas. For four quarts of soup, use an ordinary cupful of yellow split peas. Pick them over and wash them in cold water. Put them in a saucepan or a soup kettle with two quarts of cold water. Set the saucepan or soup kettle over the fire and let the water very gradually heat. When it boils, put in some cold water, part of a cupful. Let them boil again. Keep on putting in cold water every 15 or 20 minutes until you have used two quarts of cold water besides the first two quarts. The object of adding cold water slowly is this. You soften the peas by the gradual heating of the cold water. After the first boiling, the addition of a little cold water lowers the temperature, and as the water heats again, the peas are gradually softening, so that within an hour and a half, or two hours, you will find them quite tender enough. You will notice that I have used no salt. The salt would tend to harden the peas. You add salt after the soup is nearly finished. The old way of soaking the peas overnight is a very good one, but this is rather better, for this reason. If you soak the peas overnight, you destroy a small portion of their nutritive properties, 
especially if you make the soup in warm water, there will be a slight fermentation. The object of soaking them overnight is simply to soften them, and as you can soften them in this way, you accomplish the same purpose by adding cold water gradually. You will notice that this is for perfectly plain pea soup. You can vary it by adding bones of cold ham or of cold roast beef. You can boil the bones with the peas. In that way, you get the flavour of whatever meat you add. A very nice soup is made simply with the peas without any meat by the addition of a fried onion. For that soup, you would peel and slice an onion and put it in the bottom of the soup kettle with a tablespoonful of butter or drippings, beef drippings or poultry drippings, and fry it light brown. Then put on the peas and cold water and proceed just as we do today for a plain pea soup without any addition except a seasoning of salt and pepper and by and by a little flour and butter which i shall put in at the close the object of which i will explain to you then beef and vegetable soup for four quarts of soup use one cupful each of the ingredients which i shall name lean beef cut into half inch pieces carrot which must first be scraped and then cut into half-inch bits, turnip, which must be peeled and then cut in small pieces, rice, picked over, washed in cold water, tomatoes, peeled and sliced if they are fresh, but if you use canned tomatoes, simply cut them in small pieces, half a cupful of onion, peeled and chopped rather fine, and four quarts of cold water, First put the water over the fire with the beef in it, and let it gradually heat. While it is heating, get ready all the other ingredients that I have spoken of, and add them when the water is hot. Don't add salt for seasoning until after the soup has been cooking for a little while, because it would tend to harden the meat. When the soup is boiling, put in all the other ingredients, and after the soup has cooked for an hour, season it with salt and pepper cook it slowly for about two hours or until the vegetables are tender the length of time will depend somewhat on the season of the year you will find that carrots and turnips like all vegetables which have woody fibre in them will cook more quickly early in the winter while they still have their natural moisture in them the later in the winter it grows the drier they get the harder the woody fibre is, and the longer it will take to cook them tender. So you will cook the soup until the vegetables are tender, and then, having seen that it is palatably seasoned, serve it with all the vegetables in it. You notice that this is a thick soup, made in an entirely different way from that which I made this morning. I think some of the ladies are here who were here this morning. Then we were making clear soup, which is to be served without any vegetables in it. This is a good hearty soup for everyday use. In fact, it is so hearty that you can make the bulk of a meal using this and bread or potatoes. When all the vegetables are quite tender, then the soup simply is to be served. Now, while I am preparing the soup, I want to say a little about the value of soup as a food. This comes properly into our afternoon course of instruction. Many of the ladies may not have thought of it in precisely the connection in which I am going to speak of it. Habitually, Americans do not use soup. Some have grown gradually accustomed to have soup as a part of their everyday dinner. But as a rule, people have it once or twice a week. I am speaking now of average families. As a matter of fact, it ought to be used every day, because it is not only a very easy form in which to obtain nourishment, but you obtain from soup that which you would not get from any other dish. That is, you get every particle of the nourishment there is in the ingredients which you put into the soup. You can make a perfectly nutritious and palatable meal with soup at about one half the cost of a meal without soup because the soup, if it is savoury, will be eaten with a relish, and it will satisfy the appetite for two reasons. 
the first I have already spoken of, because you get every particle of nourishment there is in the ingredients, and second, because directly you eat it, that is, directly it reaches the stomach, some of its nutritious liquid properties will begin to be absorbed at once. They pass directly into the system, by the process which is known in physiology as osmosis, that is, absorption by the coats of the stomach, so that the liquid part of the food is actually absorbed and passes into the circulation in less than five minutes after you have eaten it. A very familiar illustration of that fact was made by Sir Henry Thompson several years ago in his exceedingly valuable article called Food and Feeding, where he said that a hungry man eating clear soup for his dinner would feel a sense of refreshment in less than three minutes. That is, he would feel the effect of his plate of clear soup almost as soon as he would feel the stimulus which he would receive from a glass of wine. He would feel refreshed at once. His sense of hunger, which is the indication that his system needs food, would be practically appeased within three minutes from the time he had taken his soup. Then there is another very important question, and that is the effect of soups and liquid foods on the appetite for stimulants. I am not a temperance advocate in the sense in which the word is usually understood. That is, I neither believe in nor advocate total abstinence, but I do believe in temperance, in the temperate use of everything, no matter whether it is drink or food or pleasure in a life of work, so that I speak solely from the standpoint of an advocate of the moderate use of everything. The system requires a certain amount of liquid nourishment. We have to get that in the form of liquid, and many people take it by using water to excess, drinking quantities of water. On the other hand, there are some people who never drink more than a glass of water all day long. They must drink something, some kind of liquid, to make up the quantity of water that is absolutely required by the system in the course of 24 hours. Some persons take it in the form of tea and coffee, others drink beer and wine, but a certain amount of liquid the system must have. Now, you can easily see that you can supply a part of that liquid in the form of soups and stews. It is not possible for many people to drink much cold water, it does not seem to agree with them. The advocates of the latest craze, for hot water, will get their quantity of liquid, but they will get it in a form that by and by will make serious trouble for them, because, while under certain conditions the entire mucous membrane or lining of the digestive tract, warm water may be desirable, still the excessive use of it is very apt in time to produce a serious congestion. Now the fact once admitted that we must have a certain amount of liquid supplied to the system every day, then the question comes of giving it in a form that will be the least injurious to the system. I think I have shown you one or two good reasons why soup supplies it well. On the score of economy, there is no food which can be as cheaply prepared as soup, that is no palatable, enjoyable, nutritious food. It is possible to make this soup, this thick soup which I am making now, in New York. And here also, I suppose, for less than ten cents a gallon, buying the materials at retail. And I am sure a gallon of this soup will go very far toward satisfying one's hunger. I presume, from what I have seen of the market reports in the papers, that it can be made here quite as cheaply as it can in New York. Question. Does that make very strong soup? Does it give a very good, rich flavour of the meat, with one cupful of meat to a gallon of water? Miss Corson. That gives a perfectly nutritious soup. It gives as much nutriment from the meat as is needed by the system. Question. Wouldn't a bone or two thrown in be a good thing? Miss Corson. You can put in bones if you want to, 
but I am giving you a recipe for a perfectly nutritious soup made upon the most economical principles. The proportion of meat which I use here is all that is required by the system in connection with the other ingredients. We Americans have, as a rule, the idea that there is no nutritious food except meat. We think that we get all our nourishment from meat, and the other things, the vegetables and bread, and all those other articles of food that we eat, are what the dressmakers would call trimmings. We do not regard them as real nourishing food, when in reality there are some vegetables which are nearly as nutritious as meat. Take, for instance, lentils. I do not know if you are familiar with them. They are a variety of vetch or field pea, little flat dried peas that grow very abundantly. In fact, if they are once planted in a field, it is almost impossible to root them out. They have been for ages used in all older countries, in Egypt, in Asia, all through Europe, especially in Germany. Within the last ten years, they have become known in this country. Lentils, with the addition of a very little fat in the form of fat meat, suet drippings, or butter, are quite as nutritious as meat. That is, they sustain strength and enable people to work just as well as meat. So, you see, that so far as actual nourishment is concerned, vegetables approach closely to meat. Next to lentils come peas and beans, dried peas and beans. I have not graded the different articles of food, but some day, when we have more time, I will give you a table of nutritive values of different articles of food, so that you can form some comparison in your own mind. Remember this, that meat is not the only nutritious article of food in use, and we only need a certain quantity of it. For instance, for the purpose of health, meat once a day will answer. It is very nice to have it two or even three times if we want it, or if we can afford it. But if we have it once a day, we answer all the requirements of health, and in communities where it is not possible to have an abundant supply of fresh meat, a very small proportion of salt meat, used in connection with the most nutritious vegetables, keeps the health and strength of the really active labourers up to the working point. Meat Stews For a brown stew, use any kind of dark meat. Today, I am going to use some of the cooked round of beef but you can use fresh beef, you can use raw beef, rare roast beef, or any of the dark meats. Always use white meats for white stews. Presently, we will make a white stew of veal, but for a brown stew, use dark meats. Cut the meat in pieces about an inch and a half square. Put it over the fire with enough fat of some kind to keep it from burning. Use the fat of the meat, or drippings, or butter, and brown it as fast as possible. If you make a stew large enough for four or five people, use about three pounds of beef. As soon as the meat is brown, sprinkle a heaping tablespoonful of flour over it, then add enough boiling water to cover the meat, and three teaspoons of vinegar. The vinegar is used for the purpose of softening the fibres of the meat, and making it tender. You will find that by adding vinegar to meat in cooking, you can always make it tender. When we come to treat of steak, I shall explain that. After the vinegar has been used, season the meat palatably with salt and pepper, cover it, and let it cook very gently for at least an hour, or until it is tender. To the stew, add any vegetable you wish, or cook it perfectly plain, having only the meat and the gravy. Today I am going to use carrots with it. For three pounds of beef, use carrots enough to fill a pint bowl after they are cut in little slices, or in little quarters. Of course, if you add vegetables of any kind, carrots, turnips, or potatoes, you want to put them in long enough before the meat is done to ensure they are being perfectly cooked. For instance, carrots take from one to two hours to cook. 
I shall put the carrots in directly I make the gravy. Turnips, if they are fresh, will cook in about half an hour. Potatoes will cook in twenty minutes. Small onions will cook in from half to three quarters of an hour. The meat usually needs to cook about two hours. The meat being brown, I shall put in a tablespoonful of flour, stirring it, and then send it down to you, so that you can see what it is like. The question naturally would arise about the colour of this stew, throwing in raw flour, the white, uncooked flour. You can see for yourselves what the effect is. Question. Does cold meat cook as long as raw? Miss Corson. If you use cold meat, brown it just in the same way, just exactly as we brown this, first in drippings or butter, and then putting in the flour. Only if you use meat which already has been cooked, it will not take it so long to cook as it does this raw meat. For a white stew, use any kind of white meat, veal, pork, poultry, or lamb. Today I shall use veal. To go back to the question which was debated this morning about washing meat, first wipe the meat all over with a wet towel. It is important to have the towel clean. Wet the towel in cold water and wipe the meat, then cut it in little pieces about two inches square. The butcher will crack all the bones, and if you wish he will cut the meat for you. At least he will crack the bones so that the meat can be easily cut into pieces about two inches square. Put it over the fire. Suppose you have three pounds of meat. Put it in cold water enough to cover it. Let it slowly boil. When it boils, add about a tablespoonful of salt and a dozen grains of peppercorns, or a small red pepper, or, if you have not either of those seasonings, about half a saltspoonful of ordinary pepper, and let the meat boil slowly until it is tender. That will be in from an hour to two hours, according to the tenderness of the meat in the beginning. When the meat is tender, lay a clean towel in a colander, set over a bowl or an earthen jar, and pour the meat and broth directly into the colander. Let the broth run through the towel. If the meat has any particles of scum on it, wipe the pieces with a wet towel to remove the scum. You can, in making the stew, remove the scum as you would from clear soup, but in that case you have not quite so richly flavoured a stew. The better way is to wipe off the little particles after you have taken up the meat. Now you have the meat cooked quite tender and the broth strained. Then you make the sauce. Any of the ladies who were at the lesson this morning and saw the white sauce made will understand the principle upon which the sauce is made for the stew. Put a heaping tablespoonful of butter and a heaping tablespoonful of flour into a saucepan for the quantity of broth which you would be likely to have from about three pounds of meat. That would be broth enough to cover it. Stir the butter and flour until they are smoothly mixed. Then begin to add the meat broth gradually, until you have used enough of the broth to make the sauce like thick cream. If you find that you have not enough broth from the meat, add a little hot water to make the sauce or gravy like thick cream. Then put the meat into it. Season it palatably with salt and pepper, remembering that you have already some seasoning in it. Stir the meat in the saucepan over the fire until it is hot, and then serve it. That gives you a plain white stew of meat. You can transform that into a dish called in French cookery books blanquette, or white stew of meat, by adding to it, just before you take it off the fire, a tablespoonful of chopped parsley and the yolk of one egg. You will add the egg by separating the yolk from the white, putting the yolk in a cup with two or three tablespoonfuls of gravy from the meat and mix it well. Then turn it all among the meat, stir it and dish it at once. Don't let the stew go back on the fire after you put in the yolk of egg. It may curdle the egg if the sauce or the stew boils after the egg is added. 
so you see you have a plain white stew or a stew with the addition of chopped parsley or chopped parsley and the yolk of an egg do not use the white of the egg question why is not the fat meat as good as the lean miss corson do you mean why it is not as nutritious lean meat nourishes muscle and flesh fat meat affords heat to the system that is the reason why we naturally crave more fat meat in cold weather it is not so strengthening it is heating and in that nutritious a great deal of its substance of course is wasted in the cooking that is another reason why weight for weight fat meat is not so nutritious as lean question in making this stew brown or white do you use bones miss corson you can use bones in making the soup today i used cooked lean meat that was on hand over from the soup this morning you can use the breast of any kind of brown meat you can use the ends of the ribs of roast beef you remember the rather fat ends of the ribs of roast beef after cooking the beef have these cut up in small pieces after you have cooked them in the stew if there is any excess of fat as there probably will be skim that off and put it by to add to any brown stew or gravy the fat replaces drippings in that case that is a very good way to use ends of ribs of beef cold beef steak makes a nice brown stew treated in this same way question do you skim the stew miss corson no not unless you are going to make a perfectly clear soup need you ever skim because as i explained this morning the scum which rises on the surface in boiling meat is not dirt it is albumen and blood with the same nutritious properties as the meat itself and you do not want to remove them if the water boils away in cooking soups and stews always add a little more it will save time if you add boiling water unless as in the case of peas you add cold water for the purpose of softening them you will find if you are trying to cook dried beans that it will be well to add cold water and boil them gradually question in cooking beans isn't it a good way to let the beans come to a boil and then pour off the water and put on more cold miss corson that is simply a question of taste it is not necessary to do it if you pour away the first water in which they come to a boil you pour away a certain amount of their nourishment which has already escaped in the water some people say that they like to pour away that first water because it carries off the strong taste of the beans that is a question for any one to settle individually the water would not have the strong taste of the beans if there were not some of the nourishment of the beans in it while we are on the subject of beans i might tell you a good way to cook beans plainly a favorite way in the south of france the beans to be served with roast mutton cook them in just water enough to cover them after having first washed them adding only water enough to keep them covered all the time they are dried white beans then at the last when the beans are tender leave off the cover of the saucepan and let the beans cook so that nearly all the water is evaporated and the beans have about them simply water enough to form a very thick sauce just enough to moisten them then they are seasoned with salt and pepper in that way they are served as stewed beans with roast mutton or roast lamb in regard to the lentils that i was talking to you about i think you may be able to learn something more about them from prof porter he probably would know you long ago have made their acquaintance in the form of the tares that the enemy sowed among the wheat lentils are really a species of tear or vetch if you do not know about them if they are not known in the market it really would be worth while to make some inquiry which would lead to the introduction of them but very likely if there are german people here as i suppose there are there are always german people in every thriving city they will already have had them for sale in their special groceries 
you can get them in that way, and they make a very good winter vegetable to use alternately with others. You cook them either by soaking them overnight, or boil them just as we boiled the peas, until they are tender, and then drain them, and either heat them, with a little salt and pepper and butter, after they are drained, or fry them. They are exceedingly nice fried with a little chopped onion or parsley. If you have a pint bowl full of lentils, use a tablespoonful of chopped parsley, a tablespoonful of onion, very finely chopped. Put the onion in the frying pan with a tablespoonful of butter or drippings, and let it brown. Then put in the lentils and chopped parsley, a little salt and pepper, stir them till you have them hot, and serve them. They are exceedingly good. Prof. Porter I may say that the first cousin of the lentils is well known among our Minnesota farmers in our wheat fields, and they are such an intolerable pest that we prefer paying the duties on the German article and importing them. Pea soup continued. The pea soup being now about ready to take up, Miss Corson continued. You know how the flour of the peas settles to the bottom of the soup tureen or plate and leaves the top clear? Prevent that by adding to the soup, just before it is dished, a little paste made of flour and butter. For four quarts of soup, a tablespoonful of flour and a tablespoonful of butter. Mix the flour and butter to a smooth paste just before the soup is done. After the peas are soft, pour them into a fine sieve and rub them through the sieve with a potato masher, just a stout wire sieve. After you have rubbed them through the sieve, put them back into the soup kettle with the soup and mix the flour and butter in with them over the fire. Stir them until they come to a boil, then season palatably with salt and pepper, and the soup is ready to serve. Remember, this is a perfectly plain soup I am making today, without the addition of meat of any kind. But of course you will vary the flavour of the soup by adding the bones of ham or other meat, or a very little fried onion. Now, you can count for yourselves how cheap a soup that is. Question. Can you give us your experience with regard to pea meal for soup? Miss Corson. I have used one form that has been put on the New York market. It was made of dried green peas. I do not know whether there is on this market a meal made of the yellow peas. There is a German preparation which is admirable. In New York it is for sale at the German stores. But the meal of which I speak, the meal made of dried green peas, was not at all satisfactory to me. Of course, the meal of the green peas has not the flavour of the split peas. You will find in rubbing the peas through the sieve that if you moisten them a little once in a while, they will go through more readily. I have left the brown stew with all the fat on. It is a question not only of taste, but of economy, whether you leave on the fat in addition to the first butter in which you browned the meat. A question of economy and nourishment. If the people you are cooking for have good, strong digestions, you do not need to remove the fat. The bread or potatoes which are eaten with the stew will absorb it and will render it perfectly digestible. And of course, as I have already told you, the fat serves certain purposes in nutrition. If you are cooking for people having weak digestions, then you would take the fat off the stew. The white stew I am going to finish plain, without any parsley or egg, simply seasoned with salt and pepper. End of lecture second. Lecture third of a course of lectures on the principles of domestic economy and cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson. Lecture 3rd. Our lesson this morning is the clarifying of soup or the soup stock that we made yesterday. 
caramel for colouring soup, gravy and sauces, baked whitefish, after a very nice western fashion, beefsteak, broiled and fried, and baked apple dumplings. The first thing I will prepare will be the whitefish, after a method which I learned from one of my Cleveland friends, who, by the way, is one of the nicest cooks I know of. I shall use only a little butter, and tell you about the wine which the recipe calls for. When the fish is prepared especially for gentlemen, wine is considered exceedingly nice, but that, as in all other cookery, is a matter of choice. We today will use some butter, pepper and salt. I will tell you the kind of wine and the quantity that is used when I come to cook the fish. In the winter, of course, all the fish is frozen. We were speaking of that yesterday, how to prepare frozen fish. In the first place, thaw it in plenty of cold water. Put it in a large pan of cold water and let it stay till it is perfectly thawed. Then cut it from the bone and take off the skin. Now, please write down the directions and then watch and see how I do it. The fish simply has been scaled. To cut it from the bone, make one cut down to the bone through the middle of the side of the fish lengthwise. Having made that line, cut round under the head to the bone. Now lay the knife against the bone of the fish and turn it until you have the blade cutting against the bone, holding the knife flat. It will take that entire piece of the fish off. Cut two pieces from one side of the fish. Now I am going to cut from the other side in the same way, and then I shall take the skin off. First take the four pieces of fish off the bone. You will not find this at all difficult to do, ladies. After you have done it once or twice, it will be very easy. And if you have fish that has not been frozen, it will be much more easy to do than if you have frozen fish, which of course will break a little. It is not possible to keep the pieces entire, cutting from a frozen fish. One of the ladies asks if this can be done as well if the fish has been dressed by the fishmonger, that is, if the entrails have been taken out. Yes, quite as well. This is not dressed simply because it had been sent from market without being dressed. I did not take the trouble to have it dressed here, as I am not going to use the bone of the fish. After I have finished giving you the direction for taking off the skin, I am going to tell you how you could use the bone of the fish. To cut the skin off the fish, lay the pieces of fish skin down on the board, then, holding the knife down straight, cut through the fish until you feel the skin under the knife. As soon as you feel the skin under the knife, flatten the knife out so that it lies against the skin. Cut away from you, holding the knife perfectly level, leaving the skin between the board and the knife. Hold the piece of fish in your fingers, lay it flat on the board, skin down, keeping hold of the skin all the time. That takes the skin off, and none of the fish. There is no waste there, and it certainly is very much easier to eat fish in this shape than it is if you have the skin and bone on it. Now, I assure you, ladies, if you only hold the knife flat, you will have no trouble whatever in taking the skin off. If you slant it, you will cut through the skin of the fish, but if you hold it perfectly flat, you will have no trouble. Of course, with certain kinds of fish, there are bones that run transversely from the spine out through the sides of the fish. You do not take these bones out by this operation, but you take out the large backbone. It comes out every time, and I assure you, it is a very easy operation. After you have taken all the skin and bones from the fish then, for this special dish, cut it in small slices three inches long and a couple of inches wide. Use two soup plates, or two dishes of the same size, deep dishes that you can send to the table. 
Butter them very thickly, both of them. Lay the fish in one of the dishes, season the layers with salt and pepper, and put a very little butter between each layer and plenty of butter on the top. Turn the second plate over the first one, upside down on it. Put the dishes with the fish between them into the oven to bake for about 20 minutes or until the fish flakes. You can tell about that by opening the oven at the end of 20 minutes and lifting off the top plate. Then you can see whether the fish is done or not. Now, in the recipe of which I spoke to you first, the addition of sautern wine is made. After the fish is put into the dish, being seasoned, as I have told you, using less butter than you would without the wine, with half as much butter on the layers, pour on sautern wine, that is a light, rather acid wine, just enough to moisten the fish. In placing the fish into the dish, it does not make any difference which side you put down. You simply want to put the pieces nicely together so that when you come to help them, you can lift each piece out with a spoon. There is no acid that will take the place of the wine and give the same taste. The fish is very nicely cooked simply with the butter, pepper and salt. You do not need the wine to make a nice dish. Only wine is used by the lady of whom I speak. That is her special preparation of the dish. The wine is put in after the fish is in the dish, just enough wine to moisten it. You will notice that often I will make dishes that have no wine in them. If I make dishes that require wine, I of course put it in, saying that you may use the wine or not, as you please. In this instance, I use butter, pepper and salt, because it makes a very nice dish, a very nice plain dish, but it is a distinct dish, entirely different to the dish cooked with wine. Simply two ways of cooking fish, making two different dishes. For a fish of this size, which probably weighed nearly three pounds, you may use about a heaping tablespoon of butter in all, that is, besides what you put on the plates. You will butter the plates and distribute butter throughout the dish. The oven should be moderately hot, not hot enough to brown it, hot enough to heat the plates, which are very thick, and to cook the fish within 20 or 25 minutes. If you wash the board on which the fish is cut at once in plenty of hot water, with soap and a little soda or borax, all the odour of the fish will be removed. Do not let any of the utensils stand with the fish drying on them, because if you do, it will be very much harder to destroy the odour. And, by the way, ladies, the odour of onions is another thing that troubles some persons. The odour of onions on boards, knives and dishes you can do away with entirely by using parsley. If you take a knife with which you have cut onions and chop a little parsley with it, or draw the knife through the root of parsley two or three times, it entirely destroys the odour of the onion, so that you see you never need have any trouble in that way in the kitchen. One of the ladies asks me how to prevent the odour of onions going through the house when you are cooking them. What makes onions, cabbage and turnips smell when you are cooking them is the escape of an exceedingly volatile oil which they all contain in all of them it has the same characteristics. It does not begin to escape until they are tender. The oil does not begin to escape until the vegetables are tender. If you continue to boil them after that, it will escape. If you take up cabbage or turnips as soon as they are tender, that is, as soon as their substance begins to grow tender, you will notice there will be comparatively little odour. But if you keep on boiling them, according to the old-fashioned rules, for an hour, two hours, or three hours, you know you sometimes boil cabbage all day long, you will be sure to have a nice odour through the house. In cutting the onions, of course, if you bend over them, 
that same oil rising from them escapes as you cut into their substance and will be sure to make you cry but if you hold them a little away from you in peeling them or under water or if you stand where there is a draught blowing over your hands it will blow that oil away in eating onions at the table if you will subsequently eat parsley dipped in vinegar you will find that there will be very little odour of the onion remaining in the breath now to return to our fish after you have taken the flesh of the fish off the bone you still would see a little of the fish remaining even if you cut closely then draw the fish and trim the bone that is cut off the head and the fins and the tail and take out the entrails of the fish then make a paste of dry mustard salt and a dust of cayenne pepper for a bone the size we have here a long bone like that use two heaping tablespoonfuls of mustard a dust of cayenne pepper and enough vinegar or worcestershire sauce to moisten the mustard to make a paste which is to be spread over the fish bone have the double wire gridiron very thickly buttered put the bone into the gridiron brown it quickly at a hot fire and serve it simply as a relish a sort of barmecide feast but i assure you it is very nice with bread or crackers and butter it makes a very nice little relish i might say ladies that you can treat any kind of bones in this way cold roast beef bones are exceedingly nice of course there will be more flesh on the beef bones than on the fish bones plain pastry use butter or lard or very finely chopped suet if you can get good lard it makes nice pastry by that i mean lard which has a very little water in it a good deal of the lard that you buy in the stores has a large proportion of water in it and i believe in these days it is apt to be sophisticated with several articles which are not exactly lard so that homemade lard is decidedly the best that which you try out yourself first take the butter or whatever shortening you use butter lard or suet and mix it with twice the quantity of flour for instance if you are going to use a pound of flour allow half a pound of shortening take half the shortening and mix it with the flour using a knife then wet the mixed flour and butter with just enough cold water to form a paste which you can roll out if you mix with a knife or spoon you avoid heating the pastry after the flour and the first half of the shortening have been mixed to a paste roll it out about half an inch thick and put the rest of the shortening in flakes on it one of the ladies asks about putting flour on the pastry board extra flour of course besides the quantity that you put in the pastry the only object in washing the butter is to get out any buttermilk that there may be in it after putting the butter the second half of the butter over the pastry in rather large pieces put just a little flour over it fold the pastry in such a way that the edge is turned up all round to enclose the butter that is about an inch and a half all round fold the pastry together thin and roll it out and fold it several times remember that the oftener you fold it and roll it the more flakes you will have in the cooked pastry take care to use flour enough to keep it from sticking to the board or the roller you will remember the pastry is not salted and unless the shortening has enough salt in it to salt the flour you must add it good lard makes a more tender pastry than butter question do you ever mix them miss corson yes you can mix them if you like using part lard and part butter to roll out the pastry roll it in a rather long strip that is a strip about three times as long as it is wide that enables you then to fold it and keep it in a nice shape it does not make any difference whether you roll it from you or towards you 
as many times as you roll and fold it you give it three additional layers now i might keep on rolling and folding indefinitely and i simply should make the pastry have more layers than this has but i think you thoroughly understand that so that i will roll it out and make our dumplings now only remember that the more times you roll it the more folds you make the more layers you have in the pastry keep it as cool as possible all the time if you roll and fold it three times remember that you have nine layers of butter and pastry you can roll it out more than that if you want to puff paste which is rolled and folded in this way has what is called nine turns rolling and folding it three times makes a turn the object of using marble or stone pastry slabs is to keep the pastry cool if you make more pastry than you want to use wrap it in a floured towel and put it in a very cool place then when you are ready to use it roll and fold it two or three times and it will be very much better than when first made i am going to roll up a strip of the pastry that i cut off the edge in such a way that you will see how the layers are formed and you can pass it about one of the ladies has asked me about heating the flour it is not necessary to heat the flour for pastry on the contrary it would rather tend to spoil it you want to keep it as cool as possible but in the winter when you are going to make bread if you heat the flour it facilitates the rising of the bread there you need the heat baked apple dumplings for apple dumplings after the pastry is made cut it in pieces about four inches square and about a quarter of an inch thick one of the ladies asks about sifting the flour that is necessary always for apple dumplings peel the apples and take out the cores leaving the apples as whole as possible the corer that i have here is nothing but a round tin cylinder use any apple corer that will take the core out without breaking the apple for this purpose greening apples are the nicest these are table apples put an apple on each piece of pastry in the core of the apple put as much sugar as it will hold and a very small pinch of powdered cinnamon about a quarter of a salt spoonful of powdered cinnamon or any powdered spice you prefer then fold the corners of the square pieces of pastry up over the apple so that they will lap over on the top of the apple fasten the corners by moistening them a little with cold water after the dumplings are all made brush them over the top with water or with melted butter or with egg beaten the entire egg or if you have the white or the yolk you can beat that up of course if you use just the yolk you make them a little yellower if you use the yolk of an egg beat it with a little water ladies are asking me about that little rolling pin it is like that little knife it is bewitched but the magic consists simply in keeping the rolling pin perfectly smooth and the knife sharp that is made of hardwood and is polished so that it is perfectly smooth and of course i keep it so by not having it soaked in water instead of putting water and soap on to clean it it simply will be wiped with a wet cloth and then with a dry one the thousand dents it has in it has got by travel it has been knocked around in my travelling trunk for the last 5 years the dents did not get in it by using it it may be made of any hardwood one of the ladies asks me why i leave the corners of the dumpling open i could pat the crust around and bring it right up close to the apple but it would not be so light in the first place the crust will hold together it will not break apart in baking and you leave the ends nice and light and it makes a nicer looking dumpling the idea seems to be that if i should close up the corners the juice of the apples would stay in it won't boil out much anyway 
Now, ladies, I am going to take a little of the soup stock that we made yesterday out in a cup and pass it, so that you can see what it looks like before it is clarified. That is the soup stock or broth that we made yesterday. You will remember where your recipe ended yesterday, about the soup stock being poured into a bowl and allowed to cool. That is the condition in which the stock is now. After a little, I am going to tell you about the clarifying of it, but now I want to finish telling you about dumplings, so you will have all your dumpling recipes in one place. A question was asked, I believe, about the temperature of the oven. About the same as for the fish, a moderate oven, so that you can put your hand in and count, say fifteen, quickly. It takes from half an hour to three quarters to bake the dumplings. Be careful not to brown them. If the pastry seems to be browning before the apples get done, and something will depend upon the kind of apples you use, cover the pastry with a buttered paper. The object of the egg on the dumplings is to make them a little glossy. Use either butter or egg or water for brushing over the tops. Steamed Apple Dumplings For steamed dumplings, usually a suet crust is used. You could use this crust if you wanted to, but it would not be sure to be light. It might possibly absorb a little of the steam. For suet crust, you would use half a pound of suet chopped very fine, a teaspoonful of salt, and a pound of flour. Mix carefully the flour and suet and salt with enough cold water to make a pastry just soft enough to roll out. Roll it out about a quarter of an inch thick and then cut it into little squares. Prepare the apples just as I prepare them for the baked dumpling. Instead of folding the crust up and leaving the corners open, pat it with your hands so that you entirely enclose the apple. Just roll the pastry out once and then enclose the apples in it and put the dumpling into the steamer. That is, an ordinary tin steamer set over a pot of boiling water and steam the dumplings until they are done. You must decide that by running a trussing needle or knitting needle through the pastry into the apple. It may take an hour and a half to steam the dumplings. Be sure they are done. For another kind of pastry that has been described to me by enthusiastic gentlemen who used to have mothers, a kind of pastry that melted in your mouth, it is very easy to make that. Not a flaky pastry, but a soft, exceedingly tender pastry that really crumbles. To do that, you simply rub all of the shortening into the flour, half a pound of shortening and a pound of flour. Put the shortening into the flour with the salt, rub them with your hands till you have the shortening thoroughly mixed with the flour. It looks like meal. The ingredients must be thoroughly mixed, but not melted together. Then use just enough cold water to make the pastry, and roll it out just once and use it. Be sure to keep it cool. Question. Did you say an hour and a half for steamed dumpling? Miss Corson. It will take nearly that, but you must try them. Try them at the end of an hour. For the dumpling, you can use one of the sauces I told you of yesterday morning, white cream sauce, or you can use simply powdered sugar, or powdered sugar mixed with a little cinnamon. You can use a hard sauce, which is butter and sugar mixed together in equal quantities, with any flavouring you like. Fried Beefsteak That is supposed to be the great abomination of American cooking, so that we are going now to see whether it cannot be nearly as nicely fried as broiled. It seems a heresy, but it is true, and there are very many occasions where it is not possible to broil in an ordinary kitchen. The fire may not be good, or uncovering it may cool the oven. There is a very important secret in frying beefsteak or chops, and that is to have the pan hot before you put the meat into it. It doesn't make any difference what kind of a pan you use. Use the ordinary iron frying pan, the old-fashioned spider, or dripping pan if you wish to, but have the pan hot. 
have the pan hot enough to sear the outside of the meat directly it touches it. After the pan is hot, put the beefsteak, or chops, because they are both cooked in the same way, into the hot pan. If the meat is entirely lean, if there is not a particle of fat on it, you may put not more than half a teaspoonful of butter in the pan. Run it quickly over the bottom of the pan. But I never saw meat yet so lean, unless the fat was all trimmed off, that there was not a fat enough to cook any chop or steak. The portion of fat you will usually find on meat is about one-third, unless you take the meat from the short loin, that is called the porterhouse or tenderloin steak. In that case, you have an excess of fat. There is more than one-third, reckoning in the kidney fat or suet. You may cut away some of the fat, unless the butchers have cut it away. The butcher has already cut it away from this piece, and by the way, I notice that Minneapolis butchers cut a very long and thin steak. Now, I would not advise the cooking, broiling or frying of that thin end. I would rather buy two steaks of that kind and cut off that and use it for stewing, because it would stew very nicely. Broiled, it will be rather tough. As my frying pan is small, I am going to cut the steak short. These steaks are cut too thin. A beef steak to be nice should be over an inch thick, an inch and a half thick. You can easily economize on a thick steak by simply cutting it in halves and using only as much of it as you want at once, because in almost any weather, steak will keep at least overnight. Have it too thick rather than too thin. Have it just the thickness you want and then cut it in two, using part only if you only need part of it. Trim off the outside skin, the tough skin. Scrape the steak to make sure that there are no particles of bone on it. That bone, of course, comes in sawing the steak. Cut off the cartilage at the top of the steak, otherwise the steak may curl up. Have your pan hot enough to make it sear. Put the steak in and brown it quickly, first on one side, and then on the other. In turning the steak, run a knife or fork under it and lift it. Don't stick a fork into it, because by doing that you make little holes in the fibre of the steak and so let the juice escape. Question. Will you pound your steak? Miss Corson. No, decidedly not. That lets out the juice. You make little holes in the steak if you stick a fork into it, and by pounding you let the juice out. Now, you want to keep all the juice in the steak, all the juice that you can, so that, in turning the steak, simply lift it with a fork or a knife and turn it over. When it is brown on both sides, push the frying pan back toward the back part of the fire and finish cooking it until it is done to your taste. After it is brown on one side, turn it over, and then, after that, you can turn it once or twice. The frequent turning does not make any difference after you have got it browned on both sides and you can keep all the juice in. Turn it as soon as it is brown at first, have the hottest kind of a fire, get it brown on the underside as fast as you can. Don't be afraid of burning it. Then turn it over and brown it on the other side. After that, you can turn it as often as you please. Some people like their steak rare, some medium rare, and some well done. To test steak, do not cut into it to see if it is done, but press your finger on it, on the substance of the steak. If you do that quickly, you won't burn your finger. As long as the steak is very rare, the fibre of the meat will be elastic, and directly you take your finger up, the fibre will press up again. There will be no dent there. When it is medium rare, just a little dent will remain from the pressure, because the fibre is less elastic. When it is well done, you can press on it and make a little hollow that will stay there. Do not season the meat until after it is done. Don't put salt on any meat before cooking. 
you draw out the juice by salting it. Now for the seasoning of the steak. I have already said that to apply salt to the cut fibre of meat will be sure to draw out the juice, so that you do not want to season a steak until it is done. When it is done, season it with salt, pepper and butter. The quantities you use depend upon the taste. That rule applies whether steak is broiled or fried. On that plate you will see the drippings, all that was in the frying pan. There is no juice of the meat there, it is simply browned fat. Whatever juice there was in the meat is still there. Broiled steak is cooked on precisely the same principle. It is to be put just as near the fire as you can get it. After the broiled steak is browned on one side and then on the other, just as fast as you can brown it, don't be afraid of burning it. You need to watch it, then move it away from the fire and let it cook as much as you like. Test it in the same way I told you to test fried steak. When it is done, put it on a hot dish, put butter, pepper and salt on it, and serve it hot. Question. What do you do when the fat drops into the fire and blazes? Miss Corson. Of course it will do that, but that will help brown the steak. If it is possible to broil under the fire, it is very much nicer. Sometimes the front of the stove is so arranged that you can let it down and run the gridiron under it. Before you begin to broil over the fire, you can get the top of the fire very red and clear by throwing a little salt on it. That will help to destroy the odour. If the meat is frozen, you should put it in cold water to thaw before cooking it. You cannot avoid, in that case, washing the meat. To return to the matter of pounding steak, if you pound or break the fibre of meat in any way, you let the juice escape. That makes the meat dry. Question. What do you say to the notion that so many have, that pounding the meat makes it tender? Miss Corson. You do nothing but break the fibre, and save yourself the trouble of chewing the steak. To encourage laziness, it is a very good idea. But remember, if you drive the juice out of the steak by pounding, you destroy its nutriment. You need the juice in the steak. Now, there is a remedy for the toughness of steak, which I can give you, depending on whether you like salad oil. If you do not, you ought to learn to because it is one of the most nutritious and purest of the fats when it is perfectly good. Good sweet salad oil is preferable to any animal or vegetable fat for purposes of nutriment. There is no reason why you should not use salad oil on the score of health. A great many people object to it. They do not like the idea. They think it is rather foreign, and to some people it is distasteful. But they have very strong memories of childhood and another kind of oil. You know, even that kind of oil in these days does not taste badly. Olive oil, the peanut oil, or lard oil, when they are fresh and sweet, are very desirable. To soften the fibre of the meat with vinegar and salad oil, put on the platter about three tablespoonfuls of salad oil and half a teacup full of vinegar and a pinch of pepper, no salt. Put these on the platter, then lay the raw steak on the platter and let it stand at least an hour, then turn it over and let it stand another hour. The longer you can let it stand, if it is in the daytime, turning it over every hour, the tenderer you will make it. The vinegar makes the fibre of the meat tender and the oil keeps it so. That is, the vinegar softens the fibre of the meat and the oil keeps it soft. If you want to prepare it for overnight, put it in the oil and vinegar about six o'clock, about supper time, and let it stand till bedtime, then turn it over and let it stand till morning. When you come to cook the steak, do not wipe the oil and vinegar off, simply let what will run off, and then lay the meat on the gridiron and broil it or fry it. There will be no taste perceptible if the oil is good. 
Caramel for colouring soup. A heaping tablespoonful of common brown sugar if you have it. If not, use any kind of sugar. Put it in the frying pan and stir it until it is dark brown. That is, until it is on the point of burning. See that it browns evenly. Then put in a tablespoonful of water, either hot or cold. It does not make any difference. Stir that until it is mixed with the sugar. Then another tablespoonful, until you have used about half a cupful of water. If you should pour the water all in at once, the sugar would simply boil over and burn you. Use about half a cupful of water, adding it gradually and stirring until the burnt sugar is dissolved. That gives you the caramel. Now, while I am making the caramel, I will describe to you the clarifying of the soup. Clarifying soup. To clarify soup stock. For each quart, use the white and shell of one egg and one tablespoonful of cold water. Put the white and shell of the egg and the cold water into the bottom of the saucepan and mix them together. Then put in the soup stock. Set the saucepan over the fire and let it boil gradually, stirring it every minute to mix the egg thoroughly so that it will not cake on the bottom of the pan before it begins to boil. When you have the stock made quite hot, when it begins to boil, then you do not need to stir it. But let it boil until the egg rises to the surface in the form of a thick white scum and the soup underneath looks perfectly clear like sherry wine. Then strain it. When the egg is thick and white as you see this and the soup is clear underneath, set a colander in an earthen bowl, put a folded towel doubled in it, pour the soup into the bowl and let it run through the colander without squeezing the towel. You see that is a repetition of the direction I gave you for straining the soup in the first place. The egg is in the towel. Now I am going to put some of the soup into a goblet before colouring it, so that you can see the natural colour. A light straw colour is the proper colour for clear soup. You will very often find clear soup served to you, even at nice hotels, much darker than that, as dark as what I am going to make now, which is the proper colour for the luncheon soups called bouillon. The colouring is a matter of taste. The clear soup, or consommé, is to be served plain like that, or with the addition of any macaroni paste or poached eggs, and then it takes its name from the additional ingredient which goes into the clear soup. Julienne soup is served with strips of vegetables in it, as I may tell you in some subsequent lesson. End of lecture third.